Welcome everyone. So I'm speaking in front here, but actually I'm talking about the great work that's been done by, by the whole team of Map Server. So uh, I've been more active in the old days, in like 2003 when we had the first Map Server meeting. So that's 10 years ago that the Map Server developers actually met for the first time at the first Map Server meeting in Minneapolis. I was more involved in coding in those days. These days we have a whole team of people. The team has grown. Uh, I'm going to introduce them at the end. Uh, Thomas Bonfort is listed as co-presenter. Is the most active, the most prolific map server developer these days, and most of what we're going to talk about is actually his creation. Uh, do I speak loud, loud enough for the back? Yes. Okay. So uh, the overview of the presentation. I'll start by talking about the fe the main features of the latest uh, stable releases. 6.2 was a year ago, but uh, since y many of you may not have heard of some of the features, I thought it was worth going through them. Uh, quickly. Then we'll talk about 6.4, which was released la a couple of days ago, and our plans for the future for 7. So you'll see that uh, there's lots of exciting stuff going on, even though the project is fairly massive. And then we'll end with a, a couple of updates on the admin side of the project. So the overview of the releases in November to 2012, we released the suite, what we call the Map Server suite, which has Map Server, that the one that you've known for several years. And then we included map cache, which was the tile caching environment, and tiny WS, the WFS, transactional WFS server. So we released all of them at the same time because they all joined the project uh, back in 2012. Uh, that was MapServer 6.2. And a couple of days ago, we released MapServer 6.4 at the same time as map cache 1.2. There's no release of tiny WS because there has not been any major development on that front. So 1.1 is still the current version of tiny WS. Uh, s the 6.2 release was really about rendering enhancement. Uh, so uh, we'll go over those each of those re relatively quickly. Uh, first of all, <coughs> we added support for SVG symbols. So now you can use SVG vector symbols, which can have multiple colors in your map file definitions, which is a cool, great feature to have. Support for mask layers. Uh <coughs> you can use a vector layer as a mask on top of <laughs> your under underlying layers, and as a result, that allows you to filter the output that's going to be produced by the software. So you can control that that mask with the query, and then this way control through the URL which part of the map is actually going to be hidden and which which part is going to be visible. Uh, more precise symbol placement. You, those of you who have fought with the symbols, may have uh, realized that in it used to be that the symbols were always anchored to the gravity center of the symbol. And uh, now we've added keyword anchor point and follow offset keyword. I won't get into the details, but you can find them in the docs. But they allow you to fully control the positioning of your symbol. And one of the big, big, big features was support for complex symbology, allowing us to do stuff like the meteorology uh, symbols. Uh, essentially, it allows you to have multiple labels and symbol components all treated as a single entity, which is treated in the label cache and in the collision detection as a single entity that was not possible before because the labels were treated separately. So that allows things like this, uh, which was not really easy to do before. And another one was uh, label leaders. So allows you to label smaller polygons, even though the label could not fit inside. And vector fields for the weather world, again, that's a useful uh, way to display uh, natural phenomenon like wind direction, for instance. The input is two raster bands of U and V vector values. And Map Server automatically computes, uh, samples the raster and computes on the fly the vector direction and magnitude uh, based on the spacing that you've specified in the map file. So it allows you to have vectors that are always consistent as you zoom in and out. So that's it for 6.2. I went through it quickly because Many of you have been using that already because it was out for a year. Now, 6.4 was released a couple of days ago. This time, there's still some rendering enhancements. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but we also got some, some new features on the processing side. So uh, the first one is on-the-fly contour generation. Some of you may have used in the past the Google contour uh, a program, a common line utility. So we've used that algorithm, brought it into Map Server. And now you can have a layer with connection type contour 
and you specify a raster, a DEM raster band, and it's going to generate the controls on the fly based on the elevation and interval, on the interval that you, that you specify. So that gives you uh, something like this on the fly out of a DEM. As you can notice, the controls are a bit jaggy when they're generated by Goodall Contour. So for that, we added line smoothing. So those contours can be smoothed to look more like this, which is a little more appropriate for rendering a map. To do that, we've added support for the geom transform at the layer level. Uh, and we've implemented one of the operators that's available in that geom transform is called smooth SIA. SIA stands for uh, smoothing by iterative averaging. So it's a relatively simple algorithm, but that but kind of does the job. Uh, except that when you do that, it's averaging, so it's kind of shrinking the contours a little bit. And contours, you want them to be as accurate as possible. So the other uh, parameters are actually tweaks you can make on the algorithm to allow you to, act to make your contours fit more closely to reality. Once again, I defer you to the documentation <coughs> uh, to find out more about them. So uh, talking of the geom transform at the layer level, so we've added the smooth SIA plus uh, buff support for buffer, simplify, uh, the, the usual simplify with po topology preserve, and uh, uh, generalize uh, operator. So that's the ones that are available right now. Doesn't mean that. Sorry? Which one of these do you have? Uh, yeah. So this, these, these two are using GR. This one is using a simple function that was uh, a very, very simplistic generalization method, and the buffer is using GR for GR, yeah. Another feature that's added in 6.4 is the support for list expressions. You may have seen yourself in the past having to match three values, for instance, to a given class. So you'd had to use either a regular expression like this or use a logical expression. But both had a little more overhead in, well in, in writing them, but also in, uh, in the processing time. So now you can have an expression with curly brace. Curly brace. Uh, and uh, you just list the possible values, and uh, so that's uh, almost as optimal as using constant string constants. Content dependent get legend graphics. Mm, that's something that people have talked about for a while. You know, I got a legend, and all the possible layers are listed in my legend, but then there's not features for all them of all of them in the map. So uh, one thing that's been added is the ability to say I want. Uh, I want my legend to contain only features that are actually visible in this map, based, based both on scale and actually objects that are present there. So uh, this is used mostly with get legend graphics in WMS. So this is like the, the turnkey version is available with WMS. But there's also a way through map script, I believe, to be able to, no, it's not through the CGI only. OK. So the way it's figured is, uh, for those who know the get legend graphics with WMS, uh, normally, it's this. It's just uh, you, you specify your layer and get legend graphic and the output format. But if you add SRS with height and bounding box, then it's going to trigger that feature automatically. In the past, I believe we used width and height to specify the size of the actual legend sample that was going to be generated. So the change of behavior here is that it's going to actually this is actually specifying the width and height of the map that you're referring to so that it can be used to calculate scale to figure which objects are visible or not. So that's a little change in behavior if you've been using the width and height with uh, get legend graphic in the past. Scale token. Uh, if you're working with maps where as you zoom in to the map, uh, you're showing more and more features or less features depending on what type of map you're doing. But you may have had to have several layers with a very similar definition, except the data statement was a little different based on scale visibility. So now we've added a scale token keyword where you specify a variable that you pass in the URL, like person table. And then you specify for each scale range which value that variable should take. Then in your data statement, you refer to that variable. So that variable is set based on the scale of the map that's being rendered. So it allows you to select for scales from 0 to 999, or is it, is it, is it, is it 999 or 1,000? Which way is the inclusive? OK. <laughs> <laughs> so for scales below 1,000, then you're going <laughs> to use roads. And, and anyway, you can get examples in the doc. I think you get the idea, right? 
SVG Symbology. In 6.2, we said we added support for SVG Symbol. Then uh, what we were using is LibSVG with uh, LibSVG Kero. That was a, a component that's kind of uh, being abandoned. It's what it was limited in features, plus it is kind of being abandoned. So we have not removed. Y it's not been removed yet in 6.4. It is still there, but it's kind of limited in features. What's been added in 6.4 is another library, which is called Libar SVG, that's supported. Uh, it has more complete support for SVG symbols, uh, except that one thing we need to be aware of, it's a GPL license. So if you compile your map server with it, everything you build with it becomes GPL. So those who are packaging black box binaries need to be aware of that. That, that, that That's a feature they may want to take out of uh, the build. <coughs> And uh, there's well, there's a large number number of dependencies, but usually they're well supported by the Linux distribution. So that may be a, an issue m as only if you are actually building your own executables, not if you're using the pre-built uh, stuff. And uh, we migrated to CMake with Map Server 6.4, which allows us. So we went away from the AutoConf stuff on Windows and uh, Windows uh, handmade Windows make files on Windows. AutoConf on Linux handmade Windows make files. Uh, so that allows us to have a unified build environment and to clean up some of the historical stuff that was in the autoconf scripts. So the recipe for building now looks like this. So that was the main highlights of 6.4. Now there's still stuff that's already in the pipeline for 7. We're going to call it 7 because there's, a, an imp there's some stuff that's going to be refactored on the especially on the text, text window, on the labeling uh, side. Uh, but before I get into the features, we had two Google Summer of Code students this summer for Map Server, so it's, it's a good thing. We didn't have any for a couple of years. Uh, one of them worked on UTF grid output. So uh, m some of you may or may not have heard about UTF grid. Essentially, it's a way that uh, Mapbox introduced uh, with TileMill a way that you can specify, uh, you can use, uh, you can have in more interactivity on top of tiles, of raster tiles, without having to pass all the vector information. So what happens is, this is an ASCII, like an ASCII graphic of this map. And as I mouse over this map, it's going to actually look up in a, in a string array in JavaScript. And if it finds, like if I mouse over here, it's going to find this, so it's going to show Norway. So in JavaScript, in open layers, I'm going to be able to show the attributes without having to pass all the vector data, which is much lighter than having to pass all the vector data. Uh, so this is not in 6.4. Uh, this, the student has completed the work. He has made it work. Uh, it requires an open layers patch at the moment uh, because it's using WMS uh, and not anyway, I'm not getting into the details, but uh, we were planning to f finish, to, to polish the code and integrating it in 7, so in, in the next release. Another uh, thing that's been worked on during Google Summer of, Summer of Code is what we call Scribe UI. It's a GUI for editing map files. Uh, so those who uh, are missing map edit from the old days will like to see that probably. Julien, Julien's talk after mine is going to talk uh, about that. Uh, so the one of the big things in uh, Map Server 7 is going to be a, re a complete rework of the rendering, the labeling engine. Uh, that was so that we could support, properly support uh, Arabic languages. And so there's a, I have to remember because I wrote that slide a while ago. Uh, so if you take the unprocessed, unprocessed string, it's going to look like this. But And with bidirectional, which is what we used to do, it would look like this. But what you need in some languages is to actually do some glyph shaping based on context in the string. So the, r the correct way to represent this string is actually this. So we could get to that point, I believe, but not to this one, right? Right. So now with uh, seven, with Thomas' new work, we're going to be able to do this properly. So uh, this implied refactoring the whole text rendering pipeline. It's using the HalfBuzz library for the context-dependent glyph shaping. And uh, the benefits are, are going to be not only for this type of label rendering, but also will allow things like better way, better, better centering or spacing of characters when you have multi-line multi labels, uh, and then probably better, more precise positioning around point symbols. 
something else that's being added in seven is layer level encoding. If you deal with non-English languages or if you deal with data sources in different encodings, you may have had nightmares trying to, ex to write your expressions in your map file because your map file has to be in one encoding, but then the data may not match that encoding, so the expressions don't match. So now, I in each layer, you can specify the encoding of the data source, just like you specify the projection, and then map server is going to do the right th going to do the right thing. What happens internally is that everything is UTF-8 from now on inside map server, and also in all outputs that are generated. So, the OGC. Uh, OGC documents that are generated are all, always going to be generated in UTF-8, no matter what your data source is in. Complex symbology is something that we're working on. I mentioned it uh, in another, another talk before, but uh, essentially it's to be able to do funky symbols like this, which are, th in this case, uh, military symbols, but it, it opens the, the door to all sorts of complex symbology. So in this case, the symbol is, what we get as a geometry for this symbol is actually one, two, three, four points, and the last one is defining the width of the arrow. So map server cannot draw that currently, and the other ones are also cases that we can't draw currently. So um, what we are gonna need to do is have some kind of plugin system where we can actually manipulate the geometry and then pass it to map server so that map server can render it uh, the way the spec defines it. So, and to get to that, to be able to get to that point, something uh, to that point, something else we, we needed is to be able to, uh, in the same specifications, one thing we had is a 16 character string defining the symbol. And we, we would have had to be able to support the full spec, probably write like two or, two or 300 classes, which didn't make sense, like lots of copy and paste. So what we ended up doing is implementing what we've called the style item JavaScript. So for those of you who know uh, style item auto, it's a bit the same thing, but then you can write a JavaScript function that's going to parse, write, look at the, the attributes of the, f of the shape, for each shape, and it's going to re return a class definition that Map Server will use to render that single shape, then it will destroy the class and pass to the next shape. So there's two things you can return, either a single style definition or a class which contains m multiple styles. So that's a simple example. So in your layer, you just add style item JavaScript colon slash slash in, in the name of your script. And in the code, you do whatever calculations you need to do. Then you create a, s a, a, a class, a, a style definition in this case, and return it in JavaScript. And Map Server is going to use that for the rendering. As I said, well, the next step is going to be after that the rendering plugin. So using a similar mechanism, which is not defined yet, we have work to do to be able to modify the geometry. So that's that might likely be a new geom transform mechanism. So geom transform with a function in JavaScript that would modify the the geometry and then return uh, return it to map server for rendering. I'm gonna go quickly because I'm, I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, filter translation support, so uh, that's a way to enhance the performance of WFS. It's really under the hood, so I guess I save you the details here. And a bit of house cleaning in version seven is gonna happen, so we're gonna remove the GD dependency. It's old code that was not maintained anymore now that we have AGG, which is much more performant and gives better especially more performance on the quality of the rendering. Uh, annotation layers are going to be removed. Uh, they were deprecated before, but now they're removed. The good old bitmap fonts, tiny, small, uh, medium, huge, are going to go away. We're going to miss them. <laughs> and because they were part of GD, so they're going away. And uh, yeah, in all cases of things that are being removed, there's an automated fallback. So things should continue to work, except it may be with a slightly different behavior. So now that I have maybe one or two minutes left. So those were the. No, no, we we'll would probably do it. No, no, I'm, I'm almost done anyway. I just had so much to talk about. So, so uh, now the quick the admin side of the project. So what's happened in the last uh, in the last year? Uh, actually, one thing, yeah, feature Y. Thanks to Stefan Meisel, Stefan Meisel who's here. Uh, we are passing all WCS 2.0 tests, which is currently in beta testing, and Map Server will be listed as one of the reference implementation. Or is it the one? Or are there two? One of? So it's pending uh, actually releasing the test at OGC because it's there in beta right now, so Map Server is the reference that's been using used to test the, test the test. 
So that's in Map Server 6.4 and in 6.2.2, which has not been released, but it's the branch that if, if we make a, s a version 6.2.2, that's going to include the fixes, right? So that's one thing. So we're going to get an official conformance certificate for that. And w WMS 1.3, I don't know if Crystal has done some work to redo the test, rerun the test, and submit them to OGC uh, for WMS 1.3. And uh, now we need to do the paperwork to get the actual piece of paper. Uh, so the PSC in uh, 2011, when we had uh, Tiny OWS uh, join Olivier from uh, Auslandia, who was the main uh, uh, Tiny OWS developer, joined the PSC, and Michael Smith was added. He was a very active uh, user and developer, so he was added to the PSC in 2011. This year, earlier in the year, Frank Womerdam retired. Thank you, Frank, for all your time. We'll miss you. You can come back at any time, Frank. <laughs> And Stefan Meisel was added. Welcome, Stefan. So talking of the PSC, and I'd like to invite all the, the PSC members and developers to stand up. We want the group to s oh, You are a slow developer, Frank. Is Evan in the room, too? I, don't, yeah, I know he's shy, so he's not going to stand out. But uh, Jeff's there. So uh, Tamas, <laughs> Thomas, I don't know if you can introduce him. So Tamas, Stefan, Thomas, Frank, Jeff. Mike, I'm sure I'm missing someone, and I don't I want you to it. feel upset. <laughs> I saw you know me. I've, ta I've been talking for 20 minutes now. So uh, that's the team that's making, and there's more people that you don't see here, but that's the team that makes the software uh, work. Code Sprint, we've been uh, uh, involved in the North American Code Sprint uh, in March this year. We had about 10 map server developers, but that sprint also involves uh, Google, Poodle, PostDiv, GeoMoves, and several other uh, projects. And in Vienna, our next sprint is in Vienna, Vienna March 24th to 28th. Uh, and uh, we, we've well, the sprint is the sprint is so popular that we already have volunteers for 2015. So it's going to be Philadelphia in 2015. And there's talks. I don't know if it's going to happen. There might be a, mer a mer combination of the QGIS and C sprint if we can have a venue big enough, because QGIS is due to have their sprint around the same time in Europe. Pictures of the sprint, so work, <laughs> play, eat. And they had some great lobsters for us. Uh, it's a bit dark, but the, the lobsters were awesome, and there were, there were tons of them. So we didn't starve. I guess the last slide uh, about how to contribute. You can keep in mind that you are all new, all power users, the users, you can contribute to the software. Even if you're not able to write code, if you're not a programmer, you can still contribute. You can just test. The betas when we're working on a release, uh, report bugs when you find them with a useful test case uh, on GitHub. You can uh, help with documentation, fork the documentation, add a new page, make changes, translate, and submit pull requests. And Jeff and his team are going to be happy to to, to, in to include them. And also just by helping other folks on the Map Server Users List. If someone asks a question, you've been through that already. Just help them. That's saving us time because then someone more experienced may not have to answer that question. And if you are a developer, but well then uh, bug fixes, patches, new features, help with binary builds, you know, everything, all help is welcome. So that's it for my talk. <laughs> so tough questions are going to go to the 